spaces as well. And so, you know, when folks are running a little bit late, um, like I am a-okay with just taking them breather for a second. Um, and I want to totally thank you all for being here. This is really, really great. Um, I know this is last minute. Um, this is not something I had ever thought I would be doing, nor something I thought I would need to do even last week. Um, but as you will all see, um, my dive into the horribleness that is hexachloroethane smoke um, has led me to find some documents um, that make me really concerned for people in Portland and around the country, um, especially tomorrow with Inauguration Day, um, but also beyond. Um, and so, like, that's why we're here. Uh, I feel like this research is really important and we could share it a lot of days, but the reason why we're here right now today is because I want to be proactive and get information out. I don't want to be retroactively explaining what happened when somebody died or was seriously injured um, in some random place in some other part of the country where they had these grenades and used them without knowing what they are. Uh, so that's why we're here today. Yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and right now I'm gonna turn um, the floor over to Red and Pascal who will be doing the land of the I hope you can hear me. Uh, I go by Fofaya, that's my Indian name. Uh, it was given to me when I was really young uh, through a ceremony. And I'm gonna read some stuff just because it's very hard for me to remember all the tribes. I'm sorry, I don't have that all down yet, but there's a lot of tribes. Um, so, um, first I'm gonna start with a little bit of our language, and that means good morning in Sahaptin. Um, the land we stand on is the indigenous land of Ch Chinook people. The Chinook people were colonized and spread across the tribes in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. A lot of people don't actually know that part. The nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon that the Chinook people are represented in is the Confederate tri Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sisala Indians, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, Confederated Tribes of Select, Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Reservation, Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Indians, Coquille Indian Tribe, and Klamath Tribes. And within each of these tribes is multiple tribes that were kind of just clumped together by the government. Um, some weren't even tribes that got along with each other. They were all just clumped together as one. Uh, the Chinook people can be found in the Cowlitz, Select, Grand Ron, Wasco, and even Yakima tribes. So my mother told me a story about the Willamette Falls. And um, when she was younger, her parents would come up to the Willamette Falls and they would talk about how our ancestors actually helped the pilgrims come over to Oregon City and basically settle at Willamette Falls. And what they used to call the swirls in the water, that was called wool wool in our language. So they called it wool wool. And lump is blue. And so it was wool lump. They would call it wool lump falls. So that is how basically we learned of, um, or we know of it being called Willamette Falls. Um, sorry. So when we talk about this land, we need to acknowledge how this land does not belong to us, but how we belong to this land. We need to recognize how powerful this earth that we stand on is. We need to recognize the negative effects that we can have on it. 
We need to take care of the land the same way that the land takes care of us. And I'm going to end with um, one of the ways that we show respect to the land in our culture is uh, before we do it, we have a meal, we sing song, we sing prayer songs, and then we all have a little bit of water that we pour out in front of us. And before we, we have our meal, we have to say chush, which means water in our language, because water is sacred. So that's how we acknowledge our land. So chush. Chush. <laughs> And then Coach Guy. <laughs> um, good morning, good afternoon. My name's my business name is Close Talk Welcome. Uh, my legal name is Tracy Molina. I grew up in Celeste, Oregon. Um, that used to be the coastal recreation when they split it into Grand Island and Celeste. Um, I was raised there, grew up knowing some Chinook words because it was a, a language that was uh, spoken up and down the coast. It was also once uh, had a newspaper written in it and everything. So I'm just, just going to share a little bit about um, uh, Chinook people I know in my life, uh, people that I've met here, people that I'm related to. Um, my children are enrolled in the Celeste tribe, and um, I also have relatives that are longhouse people from Yakima. And uh, these, like, these people feathers I'm wearing are from the Yakima elder. Um, they want us. They told us over and over again uh, uh, about what my sister said about the Jewish about the water is the most important thing and we it's important to remember that the Chinook people and descendants are not gone they were being tear gassed here with us we know we know some of them we're related to some of them the Chinook people aren't gone they're still here and we need to remember that for the most the most important thing is the water and the salmon and the salmon are already struggling in Oregon. Two or three rivers no longer have a spring sh uh, Chinook salmon run. But we have ceremonies, the people have ceremonies tied to those that have been going on for thousands of years and they're not going on anymore because of the poisoning and the climate change that continues to happen, the over logging that continues to happen. So I just wanted to say that much, you know, to remember the salmon and remember that Chinook people are not gone, they're still here with us, thank you. <coughs> Thank you both so much for saying that um, and for acknowledging the space that we're in. This is Juniper Simonis, Dr. Juniper Simonis. And as will become evident, um, as Koska brought up, the tear gassing and the pollution that's happening is part of a legacy and it continues to travel into the water and horribly negatively affect salmon. Um, and people and other mammals that rely on them. Only so much room. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. So my name is Dr. Juniper L. Simonis. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the owner and lead scientist of Dapper Stats. Um, like this is what I do normally for my job. Like I'm a computational statistical ecologist. Um, and I'm also now the founder of the Chemical Weapons Research Consortium, uh, uh, inner lab group uh, designed to collaborate um, and share information about chemical weapons and their impacts on the environment and people. My degree is in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University. I've published over 20 peer reviewed uh, scientific papers and over 50 scientific technical reports. I have over two decades of scientific research experience, including aquatic ecology, biogeochemistry, and environmental toxicology. The work that I'll be speaking about today was funded 100% through my company, which is just through me. And so I can declare explicitly that there are no financial conflicts of interest. The purpose of this press conference is to inform the public here in Portland and around the country of the significant human and environmental dangers posed by law enforcement's use of munitions smoke. The life-threatening uh, aspects of these smokes 
have been known for three quarters of a century, yet have been systematically removed from safety data sheets by manufacturers and intentionally ignored by police. In advance of J20, where it is expected that protesters, counter protesters and police will meet in cities around the country, I believe it is my duty as a scientist engaged in research for the public good to share this vital information that was produced here in Portland over the entire hundred plus days of things that we have learned from firsthand experience. I believe that lives are very much at risk and I prefer to inform proactively as opposed to explaining retroactively. So stepping back in time, right here to July 16th, 2020, at the height of the summer's protest in support of black lives and racial justice and against federal occupation, when Department of, Department of Homeland Security agents deployed what could only be described as an unholy thurible to disperse chemical agents into the crowd. As you can see in this video that Chuck Woodstock took at the time and documented, they literally used this as a means to spread tear gas, as they thought it was, or munition smoke through the crowd. Within minutes, reports also began appearing of novel, severe, and completely unexpected symptoms, like chemical rashes, eventually people were losing hair. I'm sorry, I've, uh, there's a number of us that swear regularly on Twitter, and this just got pulled in. Like, this was how people felt in the moment. People who were acting, supposed to be acting professionally, are tweeting, like, just horribly, horribly how they're feeling, right? And it's just so raw and direct. Seasoned and new protesters alike were suddenly vomiting, having difficulty breathing, experiencing chemical burns. Many were bedridden for days, lethargic, losing hair and weight, and feeling like they were going to die hours or days later. This is all so well documented on Twitter, right? Despite other agencies or media not necessarily documenting this, we do have a great record of what happened here in Portland over these two weeks in particular because of what people wrote on Twitter. And we have to thank everybody who lives their lives publicly for being able to document this so that I can do the work that I'm showing you and so that other people can learn without having to go through it themselves. In addition to people, um, trees, like our friend, the troubled Tilia right there, which is right over there, and these mighty American elms that were below, suddenly experienced significant defoliation. So the loss of leaves, sorry, defoliation. Um, and the stormwater trap that's right back over there, um, when sampled by BES, um, even though they um, decided to downplay this result, this sheet is in the pamphlet. Um, you can see that heavy metal concentrations and chlorate concentrations are three to 10 times higher in that stormwater drain. That drain goes directly into the Willamette River untreated where Chinook salmon den, lay their eggs, rear, and go out to the sea. Those salmon get eaten by people and get eaten by sea lions. These heavy metals all bioaccumulate. Significant community-driven research, which is detailed in the report that's in there, that's also online, the report is in the document, uh, has identified this, uh, the causal agent as uh, HC smoke, right? Uh, very, very briefly, HC smoke um, was designed after World War I by the US Army Chemical Warfare Service as an obscurant smoke 
for use in open fields and on the water to shield battleships from bomber planes, to shield tank movements from strifing runs. It was not designed to be used in enclosed spaces. People decide that this is somehow outdoors, but we are in an enclosed space, especially in the summertime here when the canopy is full and there are cars and tents and everything here. We are in an enclosed space. This was not designed to be used near people, let alone in an enclosed space. It was designed to be used on open water. But by the Second World War, the lethality of it was very well known. And so here we'll see a very quick deployment of how uh, DHS yes, is using this. Uh, smoke that was designed to be in an open field off right over in that street when nobody is around. When they've got 50 agents just walking back into the garage for no reason, they throw the fifth in a string of five in a block of these grenades. Any one of them can kill nine people. And again, this information, the lethality, is well documented. This is not hidden. This is not ivory tower research or you know, only happening in Antifa garages. Uh, uh, this was done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Produced fatalities when used in, by 1944. So much so that in 2012, CERDEC, which is like one of the, de the defense agencies, like research arm, published an un you know, redacted uh, document saying that it's like baseline usage produces hydrogen chloride and zinc chloride and phosgene that are above OSHA permissible exposure level limits. So we're not just talking about impacts on protesters, we're also talking about the impacts on all those other agents around. And I'm not gonna get into the science too much behind it, but basically, oops, that's too far ahead. Um, HC is really a chemical reaction in a bottle. Um, and the, like, the significant human and environmental health risks come from both the hexachloroethane, which is what HC stands for, and these products that are produced, right? So they're selling you a, a chemical reaction in a bottle. What's a reagent in there is a listed EPA. or what's in there as a reagent is an EPA listed hazardous waste, hexafluoroethane. What comes out is predominantly zinc chloride gas. 75% of the weight of what comes out of one of those grenades is zinc chloride gas that's molten and literally ready to react um, in a very aggressive way. Zinc chloride combines the corrosive irritation of bleach vapor, which is what the chloride ions do, and the poisoning capacity of zinc metal fumes, which will be familiar to uh, welders as something that will cause metal fume fever, a form of heavy metal poisoning. The lethality of HC smoke, even when used as intended, has been well established to be bad. No more consequential um, to my understanding of the, the, the development and the use that brings us to where we are today uh, is a story that I just recently found that allowed me more of an insight into the use and development of this weapon and my concern for people immediately. Long story short, in June of 1998, in a federal corrections facility in uh, northern Minnesota, there was a group of agents or officers engaging in a regular um, sort of hostage situation drill. They were supposed to throw a flashbang. They didn't have a flashbang, and so they, plan B was a smoke grenade, and the smoke grenade happened to be a hexachloroethane smoke grenade. They were in a stairwell 
the grenade bounced off the wall and fell back down at their feet and it instantly engulfed them in smoke. They did not have gas masks on and they were in a stairwell. They were supposed to wait for the smoke to clear to go up. None of them waited. None of the second group behind them waited. They ran through because they were all immediately feeling the effects. And you can see that here, that all of these members of these teams ended up having to go seek significant medical attention. And the symptoms that they experienced are completely familiar to those of us that were here in July. Several members were having spells of headaches and were puking. I don't know why you need air quotes around puking. Um, everyone was choking, spitting up. Later had chills, heavy chest, black mucus. It took me about five days to get over the heavy chest feeling. Right? Like, these symptoms, as I'm reading through this after action report, are just bringing similarities to what I and others experienced. As I found in this document from this court report, the weapon that was used there was our friend, the military style HC smoke from Defense Technology. And lo and behold, it also had the material safety data sheet from 1993 that Defense Technology produced with that weapon. And what you'll notice here are the hazardous decomposition products. I'm going to be sort of drawing this through a couple of uh, series of safety data sheets, and that's the line that we're going to be looking at across all of them, right? The hazardous decomposition products. And so we have CCL4, C2CL4, aluminum oxide, and zinc chloride. Right, and that's the, that's the big one, zinc chloride, right? That's the thing that is like causing lethality in people. So defense technology, here's their 1993 safety data sheet, what I just showed you, right? Here's their 2004 one that I found off the Wayback Machine. Same thing, they've got the same information, great. In 2008, Defense Technology settled with the Federal Bureau of Prisons employee for an undisclosed amount. And that employee also got a six-figure settlement from the Federal Department of Labor for workers' compensation. And so we have two departments um, at the federal executive level um, that are aware of this situation specifically through this case alone. But this happens in 2008. And then somehow in 2011, after that settlement, the next MSDS I can find, which is on an archive, now says the hazardous decomposition byproducts include nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, lead oxides, carbon dioxide, and lead dust and fume. We've lost all of the other things that were actually listed before. Yes, these are hazardous byproducts, but so too were the things that were listed before. And now in 2015, it's trimmed down even further. So this is their one that's up on their website right now. And it just says carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and sulfur oxides. So, As you can tell, there's been a systematic removal of the most hazardous compounds from the material safety data sheet, and it's specific it happened coincidingly with this lawsuit. This is defense technology currently rates our friend, the maximum smoke military style HC as having a zero health rating. That is despite hexachloroethane having a two health rating, zinc oxide having a two health rating, and zinc chloride 
in its solid form, not in its molten gaseous form, having a three health. Nobody sells gaseous zinc chloride, so you can't find like the safety data sheet for that because that's like not something you're gonna sell to somebody. My guess is it would be a four, right? It's not supposed to be exposed to anybody in an enclosed space. Four means it's basically going has a high probability of killing you, right? So like this is what they have now rated that basically death machine in a bottle, right, that can kill nine people with its output as a zero health. And this is in comparison to, sorry for the washout, their quote unquote safe smoke, which they rate as having a two health. And then they literally say on their, their page, the safe smoke formulation is considered to be less toxic than hexachloroethane. But they rate it as a two on health, and they rate hexachloroethane as a zero on health. So the internal inconsistencies are glaring. And when an individual who, say, is purchasing things for a department is looking at health ratings and they see a zero or a two, they might not read this. They might think this hexachloroethane is actually the safest smoke that you can buy because it is literally rated like that out of the available options. This is a huge concern because of how law enforcement, including our own Portland Police Bureau, do not understand even the severity of using safe smoke style smoke, which is known as terephthalic acid smoke, right? Like, just to flip back here, safe smoke has a two health rating. That means it's hazardous to your health. Yet Portland Police Bureau labels it as inert smoke and treats it as if it's okay to throw into a crowd of people, which is an off-label usage. It's meant not to be used on people. This goes further when we have media outlets like the Oregonian and the Portland Tribune taking those statements like inert smoke word for word and putting them in their reporting, right? Then what gets reported out, not only to the people that were here, but to the people around the city and the people around the country is that smoke that's being used is inert when it is not, whether it's safe smoke or more severely if it's hexachloroethane smoke, it is not inert. This goes even more ridiculously because the Portland Police Bureau decides that they would like to label um, protesters as throwing caustic, munition, caustic uh, substances on them and paint balloons when their officers are literally walking through the caustic smoke that they have thrown, right? So they don't understand the impact of their smoke on themselves, let alone on other protesters. And this gets really, really scary when you dig into the invoice that uh, Portland Police Bureau has put up, up online where it is listed from 2018 that they have potentially bought is in this like six pack, 12 pack or whatever mixed bag of weapons, HC smoke. They don't have it listed on their documents, but that doesn't mean that they don't have it. And while we've seen a decrease in the usage basically here since uh, of HC since the end of July when the vets pulled inside they did not go away They just pulled inside the building. We have in fact seen them use HC at the ice building at the end of October and this is a, uh, a, a Point for me to, to point out um, Do not pour water On HC it's not a good idea to pour them on any of these but definitely do not pour it on HC That will literally cause it to explode it's burning at probably 1600 degrees C. It will literally split the water molecules and the hydrogen gas explodes and it makes it really bad. So um, get away from it, get out of the area. Don't try to put it out. Beyond Portland, I've had people from Denver reach out to me because they have found that officers used or possibly used It's chloroethane smoke. It's on the list of things that they potentially have. 
And in advance of the 2020 Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee, in July, the police department got a, a bid for a, a vast armory of, uh, of weapons, including 60 hexachloroethane smoke grenades at a price of $32.89 each. For the low price of under $33, you can kill nine people, right? Like you could, if somebody throws that inside a building, like you can kill people with that, right? This is important because this stuff is available online. It's available in person. You know, the store here in Milwaukee is just a store out in Butler. It's not a big, not a big town outside of the city, right? Curtis Blue Line sells it, right? Like this stuff is available. And it's really, really scary. And so this is why we're here. I am scared for my friends in Denver and Milwaukee and other places around the country, as well as Portland, where police officers in advance of the protests tomorrow that are expected and beyond potentially, who have decided to arm themselves up with potential riot control agents like smoke, that they have gone and made the decision to buy a relatively inexpensive, labeled as safe, horribly toxic and lethal smoke that is actually a gaseous heavy metal. And so my friends around the country, if you see stuff like this, thankfully HC smoke burns very differently. It will burn hot for almost like a minute and a half or two minutes. It will spew flames. Do not approach it unless you have full coverage. Dermal uptake, and as we saw, skin burns are real, right? So unless you have full skin coverage or are willing to risk that, stay out of the plume and let it burn itself out. Keep a gas mask on and handle it afterwards, right? Like I don't want people to die going up to one of these and dumping a bucket of water on it and having it explode heavy metal fumes on them, right? Like people could die from that. And so we need to prevent that from happening. And so thank you all for being here and listening to me talk for as long as I've talked. Um, and at this point, I'm going to stop talking and say that all this stuff is available um, online at chemicalweaponsresearch.com slash HD. Um, and like I said, there's documents over in that bag, so feel free to take one. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. What would you say the long-term environmental impact is going to be? That's a really great question. I'm going to repeat it so everybody can hear. Augustina asked, um, what, uh, do I, what do I think uh, the long-term environmental impact will be? Uh, it, significant. Uh, so we know from studies that uh, I have a hyperlink to in the documents um, and are mentioned in the report. Uh, that show that areas where this smoke was used in Norway during World War II, the trees um, had significant uh, depression of their growth and have since had reduced growth over time. Uh, we know that uh, zinc chloride uh, basically makes bone growth and development a very difficult thing for salmon. And so you get um, uh, reduced survival of young salmon and those that do often have physical deformities that make it difficult for them to swim. Um, also the chlorine, um, that's as, you know, the chlorine that's in the zinc chloride is an environmental pollutant and uh, moves through the ecosystem in a way that is very aggressive, right? Like it's like dumping bleach in a space. It doesn't just go away, even though it's not still in the air so much, it's really aggressively interacting with things. And so um, the, the combination of that interaction and the heavy metals in particular mean that this is going to be a, a very long-term impact and it's going to be pretty broad. Is there a, a lot of research on the long-term effects on a human body? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the question was, is there a lot of research on the long-term effects on the human body? Um, and there is. So there's a, a paper that's, uh, I have the, um, it's linked to in the report and all that. Uh, it's by El Idrisi in 2014. Uh, they did basically a meta-analysis of all of the, um, all of these different case studies because, you know, it was like, you know, this happened here and this happened here and this happened here. And they documented the, um, a lot of the symptoms that came early and then sort of mid and then longer term. Um, and you basically see it's, it's not lead poisoning. Uh, your body can clear it, um, but it has significant effects on your, your liver and your kidneys in particular because like stuff gets in through your skin and so then it goes into your capillaries and then through your blood system and then through your liver and so your liver ends up being the spot where the heavy metals get deposited and then same on the way out in your kidneys and so the um, what I have read is that there's an increased risk of cancer in those particular organs but then there's also just like the damage of impact uh, and I don't know if anybody's done necessarily like a, a life, like a reduction of lifetime, like lifespan or stu study, but there's been definitely tracking of individuals that have shown significant incidents of cancer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there have been a lot of reports from people that have been exposed to these chemicals of uh, changes with their menstrual cycles and, you know, increased symptoms. Is there any research that indicates what chemicals are causing this or what uh, crash control munitions Gases are totally. Yeah. So the question was about um, uh, noting that a number of people, a lot of people, um, experienced uh, all like significant alterations in their menstrual cycle um, when exposed to um, uh, various chemical weapons, and uh, that's a really important question. Uh, I would like to point out that there has been a body of research dating back to the 70s that shows that CS, the CS molecule disrupts the endocrine cycle, which means it messes with the hormone cycle of mammals. This was shown in rats in the 1970s. So um, it boggles my mind, but I kind of understand the insidiousness behind why the story that's out there is that we don't know if CS is doing this, uh, when the reality is that um, laboratory studies with like standard methodology give us information that we we would presume that CS would be doing this, right? Um, so CS in particular is an endocrine disruptor. Uh, the other molecules that we're often dealing with are not. Um, the thing here that we're dealing with, uh, hexafluoroethane, the important thing is heavy metals, right? And I, so I'm concerned for folks who uh, were pregnant, are pregnant, etc. Like, I don't know, like, I'm not a human physiologist. I don't know, you know, all that stuff about what goes through into the baby and whatever, but like, that concerns me. It really, really concerns me. Um, so, CS is in particular there, but then we, this also does have impacts as well. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what it takes to uh, remediate surfaces or mitigate the effects of CS? Totally. That's a really, really important question. Um, so the question uh, was, uh, what do we know about remediating surfaces um, that have been impacted by chemical weapons? Uh, so like the park that we're standing on or uh, people's houses when these things get deployed in people's houses or, you know, on somebody's house that happens to be a tent when that is right here as well. Um, and the thing is that uh, there hasn't been a lot of really good study on the long-term environmental movement the environment. How do they get there? Where do they go? Um, and it depends on the molecule. Some of them break down over time, uh, more or less, uh, but they break down into gnarly chemicals too. Um, and the, the really big issue that I think um, we all need to be thinking about is the heavy metals that are associated with all of this. You know. Portlanders really got up in arms when uh, we found out that there was a, 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 you know, a facility that was spewing heavy metal dust, right? Now we have a couple of agencies that are throwing heavy metals everywhere. 
Um, and they're bringing it to you. It's not just in somebody else's backyard. They're bringing it to everybody's backyard. And so even when they throw a CS grenade, they are spewing a lot of heavy metals into the environment. And it is very difficult to remediate heavy metals in the environment, right? And so, you know, again, these weapons weren't designed to be used in spaces like this. They were designed to be used in open fields of battle amongst tanks and out on the open ocean, right? Like that's where HC was designed to be used. So like, nobody cares about that. And so there's residues that sit on the ground and slowly get washed into the, into the river. Exactly. Because it's, it seems like it'd be impossible to get out of the apartment. Exactly. And, and, you know, again, for me, that's the kind of stuff that I think we need to be thinking about getting folks to study, um, right? Like, obviously, there's a lot of research in this area that need that, you know, and this is a, a great opportunity. To, thank you all for being here to document me saying this. This is a clarion call. If you are a researcher who is interested in supporting the cause, there is more than enough research that needs to be done. Your city, our city, everybody's city, this stuff is being used and it's having impacts. And as we saw, the agencies who are using it and the standard media that are reporting it and the people who are manufacturing it are pretending as if it doesn't have an impact on you, on me, and on the environment. When we know that's clear and it's been well documented, for three quarters of a century, right? So we need scientists to break through this communication barrier and to do research on these impacts. And so if you are interested in supporting this cause, please like reach out to me or start something in your city or wherever you are. Like the goal of the research consortium is to connect people. So you don't have to go through what we went through. We created a munitions library that shows you all the things that we found, right? Like. There's a lot of information out there and I want everybody elsewhere to be safe and not have to go through what we went through over the better part of a year. One more question. One more question. How are you personally, how have you personally been impacted by this? By, what do you mean by this? Well, I know that we were, some of us have, were out here all summer. Like but personally exposed to HC? Well, or, or, or I just mean personally, emotionally, doing all of this research. How have you been coping? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the question is, like, how am I and how have I been coping when working on this stuff, um, which is admittedly really traumatizing, right? Because I am here and I was, you know, attacked by DHS and was at home healing and seeing my friends and comrades being horribly attacked with some new mysterious weapon. And to be quite honest, it was the, I felt the most called to do this research that I ever had to do any other research in my entire life because I saw that nobody was doing this work and the information that was getting out was not appropriate. And so sitting at home, not feeling safe being down here with DHS out, I knew that I had a, a space for me to jump in and feel like I could do something. And as we all know, we all move around in what we're doing. Like none of us stay doing the same thing through this movement. And it's very empowering and it made me feel very good to feel like I had a, a motivation and a goal again. And to feel like there was something that specifically I could do to leverage the, like the significant educational and like background and privilege that I have experienced by being a middle-class white person in the Midwest uh, to bring the education and training that I have to bear to help people survive and to protect the environment, right? So like, for me, that is a major motivation that allows me to deal with a lot of this stuff, but it still has a huge impact. And it, like reading through these, the case report, like the after action report where people were 
like repeatedly saying things that I was reading again in these tweets again and it's just like it's so so saddening so understandable in capitalism but so saddening that this is happening um, and you know it's difficult but I like having a community of people that have done this work and are supporting it and you all being here now um, really helps me understand that other people are getting why this is important and for me that's the motivation right now right like this information needs to get out to people and so being able to communicate it properly so people understand is like makes me feel good about myself um, and so like finding those kinds of things uh, definitely help uh, cope with dealing with you know lethal gas being sold for $33 a piece thank you thing is to try and cover as much of your skin as possible um, even if you don't have Tyvek right like if you have uh, like anything it will prevent dermal uptake as much as possible of any of these things we know these other smokes are also caustic uh, so definitely have stuff covered if you get gas like take that stuff off put it don't put it in with your normal laundry right like put that separate um, you, you know, whether you need to soak it to get it like free winds or whatever you want to do to keep it clean, keep that separate from your normal uh, uh, laundry stuff. Uh, definitely uh, having as much of a full face covering as possible. So if you have a, a respirator um, or a gas mask, ideally. <laughs> If you don't, if you just have a, a mouth covering, definitely have something over your eyes. So whatever kind of goggles you have. But um, again, like I, I don't think uh, like a lot of folks are gonna have access to proper gear given what we know is happening in terms of like the run on protective equipment right now. So um, I think the important thing is for everybody to manage and mitigate their risk um, and to um, definitely Get yourself as clean as possible with as like water as your best friend um high pressure because it'll force things off if you've got a hose outside with a pressure nozzle like that's your best friend for getting clean don't hop in the shower right away uh, get outside with a high pressure hose right um and do your laundry separately i think it's gonna be sort of your best bet but also um, keep track of your like when you've been exposed and what you've been exposed to whether you you know whether you tweet or you journal or you know whatever you do um, if you're out and you're exposed to something document it because as we've learned with the HC stuff symptoms can come days later right um, and it can be difficult to piece that stuff together but if you know that a couple days ago you were exposed to something and you didn't feel well It'll really help you sort of piece things back together. Um, so that would be my after sort of suggestion. Uh, were you kind of like respirator cartridge best or something uh, so my I am not a, a great uh, cartridge person, but what I do know is that you want ideally as if you're gonna go that way, you really want a um, like an organic vapor filter. However, uh, as I've read through this, uh, all of this stuff, and as we've been talking about, uh, I have uh, had a lot of discussions with my father, who's a retired hazmat lieutenant in uh, Northern Illinois. He's a firefighter for two and a half decades, um, and a hazmat firefighter for a lot of that. Um, and he was like, situations like this is why firefighters have self-contained breathing apparatus. Um, really the only way to be safe around air here is to not be breathing in at all. Um, even the filters are not gonna stop everything. 
some of this stuff is like sulfur dioxide that can get like stuff we're talking about very small molecules right we're not talking about cs or you know pava or that kind of stuff that are like bigger chemicals we're talking about really small molecules so like the kinds of filters that really can block that kind of stuff don't exist in any kind of price point for a general person nor does it self-contain breather right like none of that is safe and so i think that's important for people to realize that like the the breathing measures that you have to take around this stuff are pretty significant so um my suggestion would be if you're like in the moment exposed to this any of this kind of stuff is to as calmly as you can move to an area where you can get as much fresh air as possible whether that's up in elevation or out to an open field like that should be your goal you want like all of these things say if you're exposed to view and hail like get fresh air move to fresh air don't go inside like don't go um, like kind of hide out under an awning or something like that like literally get to a spot where you can do deep breathing and get in a lot of fresh air because you want to get this stuff out of your lungs before you like all the gases permeate across awesome thank you all again so so much i really appreciate it please share this Woo! broadly and widely and have a lovely day Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, very important information for those who have been at uh, Portland protests and protests elsewhere where munitions have been used. If you want to learn more, um, you should follow uh, Juniper L, Dr. Juniper L. Simonis on Twitter. Um, and then also you can go to www.chemicalweaponsresearch.com slash HC to learn more um, about the chemicals in HC or in the, um, the safe smoke that is used at a lot of protests. Um, super interesting information to me anyway. Um, I seem to believe that the uh, gas masks that I was using like uh, the the Polish gas mask worked really well but apparently you know those tiny molecules were still getting in and um, you know I felt the effects especially when I like switched over to a different mask where I was just using like the P100 um, pink filters um, I went to ICE um, like a month and a half ago, was gassed really bad, and I was sick for like three days. Um, and I'm sure the long-term effects aren't great either. Um, but that's the risk that we take, I guess, for being out here. What was the site one more time? Um, it is www. Hang on, <laughs> I forgot to. Weapons Stuff 93 on YouTube is very knowledgeable. Yeah, and if you want to learn about the best gas map, chemicalweaponsresearch.com slash HC. And if you want to learn about uh, which gas mask you would need, um, definitely contact Rosa because Rosa is an expert on that stuff. She helped me to find my first mask, which I um, unfortunately gave to one of my friends to use. Um, and then I ended up getting a different mask, but that one that I got from, from Rosa, um, was, was the best. And I like when the feds were in town and they were gassing a ton, I didn't like, I could just walk through smoke and I like didn't feel any effects or like, um, you know, didn't have any trouble breathing or anything. But like Juniper said, I, you know, probably still was inhaling some of those tiny molecules, which isn't great. Hey. Yes, does anybody else want this in the background? Be safe, Rosa. Did you get to your um did you get to DC yet? Are you still at the airport? PDAC. Alright, well I'm gonna go chat with these beautiful people over here. Hope everybody has a great day. Thank you for watching. Um if you wanna watch the replay, um or like 
share it with, with anybody who has been at protests or anybody that you think would be interested, that'd be great. We should get this information out there because a lot of people seem to think that the smoke, um, canisters that are being used, the white smoke is, um, is harmless. So, um, so yeah, we need to get this info out there. Bye. Much love. Peace, love, donuts. See you guys soon.